Thanks for holding. Your call is important to us. A customer representative will be with you shortly. You've pressed zero to connect with a company switchboard operator. Unfortunately, we don't have one of those, so your call has been rerouted automatically to the support queue. Your impatience and attempt to circumvent the system has landed you at the back of the line. Please hold. One of our representatives will be with you soon. Thank you for holding. Your call is important to us. A customer representative will be with you shortly. Please hold. Please continue to hold. You don't have much choice anymore. Please hold. I mean, what else have you got to do? We've outsourced our call desk, so you know the longer you wait, the less likely it is that you'll actually get help you can use. And I mean, really, the odds aren't bad that we've left for the day and forgotten to put on the answering service. You don't know what time it is here, do you? Have you been considering how important your problem really is? Because this could be a cost savings measure too. By making it more inconvenient for you, we reduce our workload. And that's the rub, isn't it? Just by putting you on hold like this takes away any shred of control you thought you had in this situation. While you were in the phone tree, you had this illusion of control, at least, by being presented with all of these options that turned out to be largely arbitrary. Most of your available choices would have directed you right back here, you know? It was designed that way. So the tree serves two functions. It relaxes you by giving you some vague notion of control and simultaneously requires you to conform to the system we have already established. So by the time you connect to any human being at all, you're thankful, and you're not only thankful, but you're preconditioned to conform to our guidance. It's an ingenious system, really. hold. Are you still there? From deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorkable children and planning the revolution. <laughs> that's this is what we got. That's how we do it. Yeah. That's hey. All. <laughs> so <laughs> we have a guest this week. Yeah. This is my friend Meredith. Hello. Yep. Hailing from. Are you in Buffalo these days? Yes, I am hailing from Buffalo for the past eight or nine or ten years. Okay, so I'm while. behind a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Buffalo, New York. Yeah, yes. which is a great town, I have to say. I love Buffalo, New York. I do like it. I actually moved up here for the weather, and nobody believes me when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the weather is great. I, yeah. I grew up in Erie, so I'm very familiar with Lake Effect snow. Yeah, So <laughs> right on. But, but yeah, I, I, we followed... 
we follow you guys on Facebook now, and a couple of years ago, it was really impressive. <laughs> yeah, that was something to write home about. Yeah. Yeah, so, the Wall of Snow. If anybody listening goes and Google's Wall of Snow, you'll see some amazing <laughs> photos that have been turned into the world's greatest uh, calendars. Of, oh, of this oh, really? amazing, like uh, this, like once in a lifetime lake effect uh, event that happened a few years ago in Buffalo. Wow! Now, to give you to give you a little bit of context, um, I lived on the clear side of the Wall of Snow. We got a dusting. I was about a mile north of it. Okay. Um, wow! However, my roommate's mother lived in the middle of it, um, and my landlord, who ended up staying with us for a week, uh, also <laughs> lived in the middle of it. They got. Nine feet of snow. Wow! Sweet, in the Jesus. course of twenty-four wow. or forty-eight hours, it was it, it was a disaster. Wow! But I got I didn't have, even have to shovel during the during the wall of snow. It that almost that, feels unfair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it was it was aston- it's astonishing the difference of what happened between the northern part of the city and the southern part of the city. And this is the same city. Yeah, like in the same city. Absolutely, wow. in the same city. Yeah. Yeah. Dang. Now, growing up in uh, in that area, the the blizzards that I remember from my childhood actually have names on Wikipedia articles. <laughs> 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 They're like the blizzard of seventy seven. Like, oh yeah, that was fun. Yeah, that like, was good. Yeah, I yeah. got I missed school for three days, and you know it was while well, while well, everyone and everything dug out. Yeah, yeah. and like mm-hmm. National Guard level of you know strand like hundreds of stranded motorists and right. Yeah. Anyway, I've known. Meredith for some time, and I I would scratch my head trying to remember how we even met. I think we met. Uh, oh oh yeah the was it the 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 those contests the music contests was it through the, the songwriting contest? through song Fu? Um, no, I think we just we just uh, started speaking to each other through uh, various podcaster social groups yeah like there was a there was an email list and um groups on facebook and i don't even remember it was back back in the hey back in the heady heyday (laughs) first generation podcasting first generation (laughs) podcasting and social media it was Mm -hmm. so we did meet in person though and we uh we were traveling and we stopped by at your place and with all with our our gaggle of kids was considerably smaller Smaller than than. yeah that was no, we passed through Pottstown. Pottstown. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, we you used stopped to... for a meal, and Paul sang yeah. us a song, and your kids went and played in the, played in my backyard, and we had dinner. Oh, it was all good. Yeah, and it was then good. we took the picture at the Pottstown sign. Yeah, yeah. I still yeah. got the, the picture at all the Pots at the Pottstown sign. Mm-hmm. Right. Some. Anyway, somehow I met you through, I met you via Rich, I think, and then somehow I got hip to Sean Hurley's work via you or something. Something like that. But something it's all. Like that. The details are yeah, all a little vague. You had, yeah, well, you and I have been Sean Hurley super fans for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And you had a a free form. You had, you had several generations of like you had a free form show, and you had a show of music that you produced on your own computer kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, you had you were uh, of the the Brain Douche podcast. Brain yeah, Duque. my show was Brain Douche. That lasted for six years. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah. Brain Douche was a blog before that. I think by the time that it turned into a that it that it settled into its podcast form, that was like its fourth iteration of Brain Douche. Okay. Um, and that lasted for six years and almost two hundred episodes. Yeah. Um, now I've got to ask. So, like, what was the theme of Brain Douche? It didn't really have a theme. It was uh, I called it a free form audio arts podcast. Yeah. Um, cool. It was basically whatever I, whatever I wanted to make that day. I had a, I have a background in working in radio production. Mm-hmm. So at that point, I'd done several years of professional uh, audio production at different kinds of radio stations. And when I heard about podcasting, I all of a sudden realized, hey, I know how to do this. I know how to do, do that. that. I, yeah. I know how to. I know how to record with microphones. I know how to edit audio, and I'm also a computer nerd, so I know how to publish things online. This isn't that complicated. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. There you and were. I was in radio because I enjoyed the audio production. So I just started producing things. I produced, uh, I produced music. I produced uh, 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 fiction pieces. I produced comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, any 
nothing there were no limitations was anything i could possibly come up with yeah um i I still very fondly remember your like advice column bits that were just like (laughs) to me pants sweatingly hilarious you know so yeah i never got i didn't get enough of those done um i also did a radio a one-hour radio show brain douche radio um Mm -hmm. where i'd i'd cut together some of the strangest uh audio i could find oh yeah you dug you dug up a lot of old vinyl like old vinyl stuff, Herd Al- yeah. herb alpert and all this mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. yeah fun all this fun uh, 70s cheese music and whatnot yeah. yeah 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 like the cheesy the cheesy vinyl that was uh cashing in on herb alpert's success kind oh of stuff. <laughs> okay right, right, right. so and the old cartoon old comedy albums and old cartoon yeah. uh kids albums i had some i had uh i had boris and natasha uh, for my outro, oh, that's yeah. very fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's very fun. So you some, were some you, really weird workout albums. Those are my favorite workout albums. <laughs> so you were a bit of a like uh, abandoned copyright rebel as well, too. A little bit, yeah. But I wasn't working with anything. I, I never had a very large audience. I never had uh, yeah. more than about a hundred listeners at any given time over those six years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem is, is that a lot of people fondly remember me and my show. Be- and I think I had an outsized influence over my actual audience numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because everybody who listened to my show was a podcaster. I started there. So all the <laughs> podcasters were show. listening to me and then they were talking to their people. So it sounded like I was a lot more important than I actually was. So Lou, um, Lou Reed said that, you know, not very many people heard the velvet underground's first album. But everybody who did started their own started band. A band right. <laughs> yes, not many people heard Brain Douche, yeah. but everyone started their own podcast. Yeah, no, I mean mm-hmm. it was it was an inspiration to me. I, I had been doing this audiobook stuff just in my bedroom, you know, in a, in a, in a bedroom, staying up till four in the morning to get some quiet to record, and yeah. um, uh, that some of that stuff is still up there. But then I did the Pot's House General Purpose podcast, which was uh, 101 episodes and was a lot like you a lot of it was just uh whatever i wanted to to felt like recording and a lot of stuff was found audio with portable recorders and it was in a way a lot of it was kind of aggressively anti um art (laughs) in that (laughs) in that i was literally making that like the audio collages i think 99 percent of people if you made them listen to this audio collage for an hour they would go mad with rage. Why? Why have you done this to me? <laughs> but I've made them very much for myself and that I really find this kind of stuff to be soothing and fascinating, you know, to mm-hmm. like just listen to mm-hmm. environmental sound and, and you know, slice of life. Like, uh, you know, I used to take the portable recorder to go grocery shopping. Mm. Right? <laughs> and that was always oh, a sight. did. You did a recording for my show. Do you remember? I did. Yes. I, I, yeah. Uh, uh, for my hundredth, for my hundredth episode, I I decided not to do a hundredth episode and let other people do it for me. Yes. Um, and you contributed a binaural recording of getting your beard trimmed, and it's absolutely yeah. fascinating. And yeah. I can't imagine anybody wanting to listen to this, but I think it's amazing. <laughs> No, it's it's really just you and I have this in common. We just love sound, I think. Yeah. And um yeah. and so no, I listen to it now and and still uh, it's uh oh, yeah, it's a haircut and beard trim and there's a little radio on in the corner of the barbershop. And I had them cut my hair while I was wearing these little in-ear microphones that I had got from somebody on eBay and going into a portable recorder. Mm-hmm. And at one point, one of the, the little earphones, the, the little mics pops out and suddenly the, the stereo image is all, it's all bizarre and everything's moving around. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you now it's funny and I, I'm glad I, I did that and had that experience. But yeah, that, that podcast is on kind of hiatus and then a year, roughly a year ago grace and i said okay we got to do a weekly thing and just get just, get stuff out just get stuff out get, get try and build an audience by ha- doing a weekly thing and don't obsess about whether it's polished enough just get a show out every week yeah so here we are here we are <laughs> so, <laughs> with our unpolished show coming out again this week so i am right just going to c- comment that meredith has an air conditioner running and we're not going to ask you to turn off the air conditioner because we want you to live. <laughs> we want you to live. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's guys. super. It's been super hot, unnaturally right. hot here, as yeah. well. So I can only imagine how you're doing there. But yeah. um, it's but, not. It's not great. No. It's not no, great. and I, 
I, I can't speak for anyone else, but I know I suffer greatly in the heat. Yeah. And I'm, uh, you know, barely functional. So I'll see if I so. can clean up the background sound on your track a little bit, but you might hear this continual we'll, noise. It is what it is. It, we'll, it, we'll all survive. Yeah. So um, this, uh, we wanted to interview interview you in particular because of our, our theme uh, of millennial economics, which we're doing for for this year for the show, and we're trying to get actual live millennials <laughs> to talk to us <laughs> about their the lives, wild. about their the lives, and the economics of their lives, mm-hmm. and how everything has uh, affected their lives and personal stories. Mm-hmm. Rather than just be, I'm a Gen Xer. And rather than just have Grace and I like pontificate about millennials, <laughs> <laughs> those whippersnappers, we could tell them a thing or two. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we uh, we've had our own economic challenges, but I th- believe that in a in many ways we got it had it much easier than millennials have had. Insulated in a lot of ways, and we are insulated in a right. lot of ways, and so we really we want to hear from from real millennials so tell us uh tell us your story so how's it going yeah yeah well i am the world's oldest millennial i'm 37 years old so i'm at the absolute upper limit of what you can consider a millennial yeah what what, right. what, um, what year were you born 1981 81 81 okay, okay. yeah that's that's on the line but it's on know. the line but we'll allow it we'll <laughs> <laughs> hey i warned you when i when you when you put out the call um well what what would you like to know um, so what has work life been like for you? Um, and sort of, um, what, whatever you're comfortable talking about I'd, as far as like what the kind of life you can afford compared to say the kind of life your parents lived. I'd like to go yeah. back even further actually and talk about how, like how you grew up thinking about what you expected to do with your education and, and your career and maybe maybe compare or contrast that with how it's actually played out. Right. So, Well, growing up, I did expect to have an education and a career, and um, arguably neither of those things have actually happened. Um, mm-hmm. I'm a college dropout. Uh, I've uh, I had one year, uh, I went to Fordham University and ended up uh, dropping out after that because of uh, the economic reasons, believe it or not. Yeah, that, um, <laughs> really? <laughs> you don't say yes. It. <laughs> and it's 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 really it's it's a interesting story. Um, my my mother has two brothers, and they've all done had different. De- very different degrees of success. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of one one of my uncles uh, has become incredibly wealthy, mm-hmm. and one of the things that he's always said since I was a little peanut was that I'm going to send you to college. Well, it, it turned out to be a complete disaster, <laughs> um, oh. partially because um, my mother never went to college, so the process of getting signed up to go to college. Um, was a it was a fiasco because she didn't know what to expect and a, I didn't know what to expect mystery. and my uncle lived in another state oh right? I see so I, at the time you know I I, I knew to I knew to do the college applications and send them out and then um, and got the acceptance and sent that off and then my mother said you need a job for the summer between high school and college okay so I went and did the same summer job I've been doing for years mm. and was a sleepaway summer camp counselor so right. I was gone and then at the end of the summer the mail was piling strangely up. nothing's nothing's gotten done oh. it, it oh, didn't just all Lord. automatically happen so it started out that way I now, love that word automatically <laughs> Yeah, it just didn't automatically happen. Um, so uh, my first year of college was paid for by check while my aunt and uncle were on a plane somewhere. <laughs> on the phone, right. on a plane, literally talking to the bursar's office, writing out checks in the air. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. And so... Uh, what, what kind of a I, school is, is Fordham? I don't, I'm not really well, familiar. Fordham University is... Um, at least when I, I, it may have changed, but at least when I went, uh, Fordham University is actually part of the Ivy League technically, um, because the Fordham Rams, their football team, plays against Harvard and Yale and Princeton I, and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I grew up something. thinking I grew up thinking it was a second tier Ivy. 
Really? So it wasn't okay. Yale, it yeah, wasn't Harvard, but they play with Yale and Harvard. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. Uh, a lot of people think Ivy League is it has to do with uh, some kind of quality or or, or It's class analogous or to Stanford. Like it's a sports It's analogous league. <laughs> to Stanford. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what 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 were you going into? What were you planning to go into? Um, I was getting a degree in communications. I was going to grow up to be a radio producer. So you had that, that interest going way back. Uh, way yeah. back, yeah. 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 Way back. Um, my biggest problem was that uh, I probably wasn't ready to be on my own and mm, I think I it's had, a common it's a common problem <laughs> and I picked up absolutely no study skills or you know self-control <laughs> in high school as you know, I was a smart kid and I got kind of crummy grades actually yeah, high school is yeah. the worst for smart kids yeah oh, yeah 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 I was a smart yeah, kid I had no study skills I had no ability to, to concentrate or focus and so I had kind of crummy grades in high school if you and, and once you're in college, if you don't discipline yourself, there's nobody yeah. holding a stick over you to make you do your work on time. So. Right. Yeah. So surprisingly, yeah. I got exactly the same crummy grades while I was in college. Mm. Yeah. It, it, identical. Just, you know. And it was decided that uh, my my uncle decided that if I wasn't going to uh, have, it wasn't going to take this seriously and get good grades, he wasn't going to. Uh, pay for any more college, so I was brought home after a year. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So. And then what happened? <laughs> yeah, that's, um, what, that's the interesting story. Yeah. So yeah, then yeah. what happened? Oh, a whole bunch of stuff happened. I ended up. I, I lived with my parents for a little bit, um, and then my mother kicked me out of the house. Um, um, yeah, that happens. Not for even any particularly big reason. It's just I was being defiant. Oh, yeah. Um, like she said, I'm, I wasn't allowed to go to a party, so I went to a party and mm-hmm. it wasn't, it wasn't like I was going to a party and there was drinking and drugs and craziness and, and it was, you know, a party. it was my friends playing board games in another town. <laughs> and, uh, there, so because I, because I had to fight her, she kicked me out of the house. So I went and lived my, with my grandparents for a little while. I think it's, I think uh, that situation. No, no, that's not true. There was a peer. I, I ended up living with one of my friends for a month and then I stayed with my grandparents for a little while and then they got sick of me and kicked me out and I went back to my mother's house. <laughs> bing, bing, bing. It's, so it's a frustrating. For about three or four years. <laughs> it's a difficult time, you know, because you're, you, it's your, ta- your developmental task at that age to become independent. But your parents don't necessarily just want to give you a pass for everything, and they don't necessarily see it that way. And they're they're so used to the the parenting role, it's hard to just to step switch back. that off, or switch it off, you know? or yeah, yeah, yeah. So and it's so almost like, like it was a little little chaotic, a little chaotic. Yeah, yeah. And did you did you settle into some work you enjoyed or um, something not, that you've yeah? Not really. Um, over that time, um, I had a lot of jobs. I started initially. I worked at a Seven Eleven. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I did the morning shift at a Seven Eleven, um, making like a quarter above minimum wage. Um, working thirty, working just in just few enough, uh, just enough of the hours, uh, just enough hours every month or every week that they didn't have to pay me, pay for my health insurance kind of thing. So it was like yeah. right. seven and a half hours. Yeah. I was telling thing. Grace uh, when I worked in, uh, during high school, uh, the, the grocery store used to assign me 39 and a half hours a week of, mm-hmm. of work for that mm-hmm. reason. Yeah. 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 It was, it was one of those. And uh, I made just enough money that I could pay my rent that my parents were charging me and buy a carton of cigarettes. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> That's what you got. So There's I don't your, know what I was supposed to accomplish with this job, but that, that's... that's nah, you paid your parents rent about cigarettes. You should have been able to work yeah. that job for a summer and had a whole had a whole semester's uh, uh, tuition yeah, pay tuition for pay. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. Well, now, and so how did you eat? I'm just curious. Uh, my, par- my parents were kind and... Uh, oh, they and fed you. paid for my food. They did, they did feed me. They, 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 they were... That's all right. That's right. Yeah, the, the the rent did pay for food and heat and all the amenities oh, okay. and internet, okay. you know, things okay. like that. Right. Um, but but uh, did not pay for did not pay for transportation. Did not pay for uh, did not pay for my cigarettes. Did not pay for transportation. Things like that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. So you were in this boat that I think a lot of people are in, where they're not actually. They're working, but they're not able to build up any real assets to launch of any kind. Yeah. Right, or to to do anything except stay on the treadmill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Right. 
Yeah. So I, I did that for a while, and then I became a temp worker. I was a mm-hmm. temp worker for several years, so I bounced all over the place. I've done some of those like temp office yeah, I, gigs. I did, I did temp, temp working stuff. after I dropped out of grad school. Yeah. 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 I was an office temp for two years, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, after that point, uh, my mom uh, was actually part owner of a business, and she ended up hiring me. Uh, doing land title insurance, and this was during the real estate boom. Just to give you an idea of. Oh right, right. Yeah. Um, so she she was running a title insurance company for for a mortgage broker, mm-hmm. um, and she ended up hiring me. Um, I think she finally took pity on me, <laughs> um, <laughs> so and found a job that I job. could do there, and I did that for several years. So you mm-hmm. learn um, you learn some of the technicalities of that industry, and there are a lot of technicalities mm-hmm. of right. that industry. Yes, right. it is entirely technicalities. That's all it is. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, did that for a couple of years, and uh, then she fired me, and then she rehired me, and then she fired me. <laughs> oh my <laughs> yeah. God. <laughs> Sorry, and then I, I came laugh. back, and I and I, I think I ended up working for her three different times in three different mm-hmm. offices. I'm just mm-hmm. imagining like the actual frustration involved in all this, like right. no the clean, ex- oh, yeah. no clean break, no clean transitions. It just keeps going back to back. The dialogue yeah, like, continues, uh, right? Yeah. yeah, I think I ended up working for her three times, um, yep. and then I worked for another title insur or another title insurance company, um, in between. Hmm. Uh, so where were which you? Was a which was a disaster. <laughs> they were terrible people. Where were you and, working and, and, at the time when we actually met you in Pottstown? I was convinced she was self-employed at that time. Were you? Were you self-employed? Somebody was. Yeah. Uh, that that was right right before. I think that was right before I started. Uh, I started my my stint of self-employment. Mm-hmm. Um, so. W- f- the last real job that I had, um, mm-hmm. I was an archivist for this um, environmental consulting company. Um, mm-hmm. They're basically the people that go and read the chemistry reports over Superfund sites okay. and tell, mm-hmm. and tell you know DuPont and Exxon and Sunoco and all the biggest polluting companies in the world mm-hmm. um, how to clean up their Superfund sites based on the science. Right. That's their job. And so this company has been around for 25 years, and they never really had a very good plan of what to do with all of their paper after mm. they were done with it. So they just kind of stacked it up in <laughs> closets. God. Good and move. 25 years later, they called me oh, in to run wow. a scanner to try and digitize this stuff and get rid of it. Wow. Sorry. Um, and I did that for about two and a half years and actually really enjoyed that job. It didn't pay particularly well. Yeah. But, right. um, yeah. but, but I got that job like through, the, through the temping. And so I uh, ended up sticking around and, and uh, making a thing out of it. So a couple of those jobs, the the real estate work and this this kind of archivist work, mm-hmm. are re- really they are the kind of jobs that traditionally would have required some credential, and they definitely required at least an apprenticeship sort of education, and traditionally would have required some actual training. Right. And. Well, with the with with the with the title insurance, there is a credentialed person in the office, but it's one of those cases where you need one credentialed person to supervise. And they can use and to supervise and to and to check the it's work like product sign before off on, for, yeah yeah and to sign off. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, but it was one credentialed person, and then um, at their biggest, I think they had twelve employees in this title insurance office, wow. all of yeah. whom were under twenty six. Um, working, working for cheap office, office kids. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, or um, at when well, they had a dozen people, maybe they had two credentialed people there. Right. Yeah, um, it, it's one of those. The, there is a person who is making money and who is credentialed and who is a professional. Um, right. But employing employing a little a little army of of uh, of uh, office monkeys to yeah do the, to do push the paper work. around to push the paper and yeah. do the stuff right but exactly I guess what yeah. I'm what I'm getting at though is it does seem like at, at that time at least there were these entrees into this kind of work for someone who was basically smart and could pick up things and was some, motivated to like you know create a system for archiving documents or what and set something up right but but yeah like you. Um, without the credentials and without the the employment classes and whatnot and the the tiers involved, you weren't paid what a person with actual responsibilities with the credential would have yeah. would have been mm-hmm. typically paid. And I mm-hmm. think that's super common now too. And that's yeah, yeah. and slightly appalling. <laughs> 
<laughs> right, right. At that point, I never made more than about fourteen dollars an hour. This is about ten years. This covers about ten years after I graduated yeah. high school. All of this, mm-hmm. all of this nonsense. And in that time, um, I managed to um, uh, try and get back into college twice. Mm-hmm. Because my parents were like, no, you need your degree. You need to go back to school. You need to, you need to do this thing. And I would go and sign up at the community college and take a couple of classes. And then something would get difficult in my life and I would stop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that yeah. happened twice. So even though I only, went, I only had one year of college and somebody paid for it and I did a little bit of community college, at the end of 10 years, I still had student loans. They weren't very big. Yeah. But you had them. Yeah. But I had student loans, too, and, and no particular uh, education to speak of. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, it's, uh, but at that point, I'd also bought a house. I mean, you guys saw it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, my partner at the time, she had, was uh, working for a drug company, which uh, there are a lot of drug companies yeah. in that part of Pennsylvania at the time, mm-hmm. um, and had a, had a reasonably good job. And between my okay admin job and her reasonably good um, uh, no-college degree required IT job, um, mm-hmm. we were able to... And between and my you know connections in the real estate industry, we were able to afford to purchase a house. Right. Um, right. Now it was a zero. Now remember, this was the, the housing boom. This is right. The price. So, right so before the, the this crash. Is the boom. This is right. Um, yeah, right before the crash. Just right, um, like so like the, a year before. So the yeah, property yeah. was slightly overvalued, and we managed to get a zero down payment, no fee loan. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so we didn't even have, so somehow we even managed to, uh, or no, I know exactly how we managed to get out of paying PMI with, with no down payment. Hmm. Not because bad. We ended up with two, with, with two mortgages. Mm-hmm. Um, and we own that house. Mm-hmm. Um, switch. So it, it, yeah. it, it was, it was all, it's all very odd. <laughs> all very odd, but you know, it, it makes sense in context, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. absolutely makes sense in contest because we to have the amount of space that we wanted to live in would have been it was uh, it cost just about as enough uh, uh, yeah. just about the same to rent as it did to buy. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even at that time. And how did you guys? After all was said and done, how did you fare with that property? Was um, we had to we had to take a significant loss on mm-hmm. it. We ended up short selling it, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, the second, the, the first mortgage company, we had to we had to sell it short and and had take write offs. The first mortgage company, the made the eighty percent major uh, major lender, um, mm-hmm. had no problem, took the write off. And at that time, uh, I believe it was President Obama had a uh, had a short sale <coughs> forgiveness program going on. Mm-hmm. So I got a, I, we got forgiveness into the tune of like fifteen thousand dollars on our taxes. Mm-hmm. So it so it didn't so that was awesome. Yeah. Um yeah. the uh the 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 second mortgage company pursued me for years trying to get payment back. I think they finally stopped and I think it's actually been enough time that it can fall off my credit. Fall off your credit report now. Mm-hmm. And that so you got some forgiveness on your taxes, but it was still it still you still took the credit hit. Yeah, I did ended up yeah. t- t- taking credit hit. But right. But, <laughs> right. Um at that by that time, I was already self-employed, uh, so right. um, mm-hmm. we were moving into a. We we at that point moved into try to living a zero debt lifestyle, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, with, and not using any credit at all. So it was actually a really good time to take to take a hit on my credit <laughs> because we weren't using any. Yeah. So we're trying to live yeah. live as minimalistically as possible at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, to so we could afford to uh, work for ourselves. Right. We keep explaining to the kids that we want to live a minimalist life, and they're they're not buying it. So they're like, <laughs> "That's cute, mom. That's funny. Where are my toys?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want a bed. Come like, on, no, no. Just, 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 uh, just, just you relax. Can, you know, you mattress can, is good. A mattress with with your siblings, it's fine. I mean, it's you're fine. a little crowded, but it's That's good. Uh, yeah, my own bed. <laughs> my own. Yeah, it's the selfish little children of yours. I know. Yeah, yeah. All day, every day. We're still just uh, F- FYI. We're still trying to unload our our home our in Saginaw, home. Yeah. and we're oh, we're going to take a huge loss. However, it plays out, we're we're, mm-hmm. we're looking at a loss. We're looking at a huge yeah. loss, and um, 
yeah. we're trying to figure out how we can possibly get through that without destroying my credit because um that's how you get jobs that's how so when you apply for a job as like a senior software engineer companies run your credit like so mm-hmm. let's take a look and at if that. i do lose my current job and have to tr- try and get something comparable in pay anytime soon i'm afraid that hit is going to be uh important an important hit yeah. so we're gonna see how we can work that out so tell us how you somehow made this sort of sidewise jump into it and programming yeah because well, that's that's more yeah. recent right mm-hmm. it okay is, yeah. it is more recent it started 10 years ago 11 years ago 12 years ago. let's call it 12 years ago Mm-hmm. At this point, um, wow! I think. Sorry, <laughs> it's been a while. The years just pile up, you know, and you look <laughs> suddenly you're like, "Wow, what happened?" Oh, that wasn't like last year. Oh, I'm, sorry, never mind. I, I was just in my thirties. Yeah, <laughs> that was that's cute. But yeah, so you you moved, yeah. you made a lateral move to to IT work, and you were yeah. working for yourself for a while doing the minimalist thing, which mm-hmm. is a good thing. I'm not knocking that. Yeah, just if anyone oh, we're, mistakes we're, my tone. If you can live like. Debt free, uh, debt free, and especially free of the financial services industry. Right on the tender mercies of the financial services. Amen. Yeah, more power to you. That everyone, everyone should. Everyone should should try. Yeah, yeah. but we're not yeah. able to at the, the present at the time. But because so you know. Um, so you know, all of my life being kind of a nerdy kid, I've always made websites. And it, it just you know, I. I am a millennial. I, I grew up my, my my entire life. I have had computers. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm the world's oldest millennial, so they were very old computers. And, <laughs> but you uh, had them, and you were <laughs> and, great. I had fun. them. I there were. I had computer uh, education in every grade growing uh. up, um, including preschool. And I was born in 1981, so I think I just got really, really lucky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you're, there, was, you're about, but there, there was technology education every every year. You're about 14 um, and, years younger th- than I was, and they didn't have computers growing up for me until like my high school had some Apple IIs. My yeah. high school had some had some computers, and I yeah. had I had computer education in high school. Uh, now I did have a a personal computer in seventy seven seventy eight when my family got a TRS eighty, but that was that was very unusual that, that right. was me being a yeah. uber nerd and hanging out at the radio shack and begging begging, uh, begging for my own computer because i had learned how to program <laughs> you know, maybe we should get the kids a bed you know i mean your mom got you a computer we could probably get the kids a bed. <laughs> they can i'm li- just saying you know they can lie on a computer oh yeah <laughs> anyway <laughs> they're warm you know they're warm in winter well just li- all the broken all the laptops they've broken we'll just spread them out flat and they, they can, can lay lie on them, them. <laughs> anyway sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Go on. <laughs> yeah your kids are tough on technology i have i, have I can't this. even oh my yeah, god i can't even uh, yeah so, so so growing up dirty make websites it's a thing um when i was in high school we made websites for after school in the computer lab. It's just what we did. I had AOL in middle school and they had a pages function and I'd make websites. So, and just moving forward, whatever my hobby happened to be, I would often make a website to go with it. That's just what you did. What mm-hmm. I did because mm-hmm. it was fun and it was the internet and it's right there. Um, and just after several years of practice of this, and at the time my partner was, um, of of these same nerdy type um somehow we managed to we, we sold a website to somebody that she knew um and it worked out very well so we built a website and and uh and uh, uh got paid to do it it was pretty cool um i should say at this i i should inject here that uh that my ex was kind of a serial entrepreneur she was constantly mm-hmm. starting new business. Whatever she was interested in, for some reason, she always turned it into a business. So we start, she had ran several businesses and we, over the 10 years that we were together, we started quite a few businesses. So it's not like just all of a sudden, hey, magical. This was a the thing happened. she was doing. Yeah. This was a thing that she was just constantly doing. You were, um, you were doing, possibly, you had yeah. a jewelry business for a while too. Yes, and that she was did another. A, we did a jewelry business for a while. She was a caterer. There were 
there, there was there was a lot. She always had a um, side hustle. A side hustle always or a main had a hustle. Side hustle and often, usually more than one. So wow. anyway, so we made made website and sold it, and then made another website and sold it, and made another website and sold it. And all of a sudden, um, just kind of kept uh, kept steamrolling like that and snowballing. I guess I should say. <laughs> and I just kind of kept snowballing, and she thing. realized she hated her job, and she was doing more than forty hours a week doing these websites. So she quit her job, and it just mm-hmm. kind of kept going and kept going and kept going, and all of a sudden. Um, I was doing more than 40, 40 hours a week doing it, and I quit my job. And all of a sudden, we were full time doing this, um, doing these doing uh, the website thing, doing these websites. Right. Um, so it was, it, and, and at the time, we were trying to be professional bloggers as well. That was a thing. Oh um, yeah. Doing personal yeah. finance blogging. That's where that minimalism thing came from. We were doing a oh. lot of personal finance blogging, trying mm-hmm. to figure out how to be in your twenties and. Um, and uh, not completely broke, and then how to be in your 30s and retired, you know, that, that kind of... I, knew, space. I did yeah, know people... That, I, yeah. I did know people who figured out how to how to do, like, piecework blogging, like it paid for posting for different companies and whatnot. I mm-hmm. never figured out anything in, to in do with that. In the late 2000s, like, I want to say 7, 8, 9, yeah. mm-hmm. um, there were a number of people... Who tapped a vein? Yeah, yeah, like if you didn't hit the vein, nothing happened. Right. But if you tapped a vein, if you were a freelance writer who could get stuff cranked out on a deadline, you, and you even could, you could get paid to blog. Like I yeah. know women who were doing like natural hair blogging in the right time in the mm-hmm, right place. Mm-hmm. They started making three hundred thousand dollars a year. Wow. For like a period of three to five years, and then it like dried yeah. up and went away. But there was this space in the late two thousands where if and these women weren't like writers. They mm-hmm. just showed up every day and said something uh-huh. on the mm-hmm. on the subject in which people had interest. So you had to hit the window. You, yeah, yeah. It really, it was about right tapping the right vein at that time. That you yeah. could really just something could take off, mm-hmm. and it was almost arbitrary. Not entirely, yeah. but it was almost arbitrary. I was so aggressively. Uh, see, I started blogging in the '90s, you know, but um, before it was even a thing. Putting stuff up on wikis and just just on uh, mm-hmm. like uh, Gopher, no <laughs> Gopher I, and FTP. My I, blog was a, a text files on an FTP site, and you could also <laughs> dial up. No, no, no. My blog was a bulletin board. <laughs> but no, it goes. So, but I was so aggressively like anti anything that anyone might possibly want to read. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah. Like no one wants to read this. I, yes, <laughs> I was very frustrated because I used to track my hits on on Google uh, on Blogger, and I was really close to getting my first like check as far as they would pay out it when you hit a certain number of impressions. Mm-hmm. Right. And then like the then like a week before they I would have gotten my first check, which was like for twenty bucks or something like that. Right. Yeah. Um they changed the threshold and made it like ten times higher. higher. So they would only pay if you reach this <laughs> like, l- higher threshold. Like, you know. Yeah. St- anyway. There's yeah. there's there's that that kind of uh, almost arbitrary success thing i think is how it we're on the seeing the tail end of that on youtube right now as well right. oh yeah yeah right it, yeah youtube had a thing yes. with podcasting it's happening on youtube now some right. idiot kid now is a millionaire and can be an idiot asshole kid and and somehow thinks that it's because of his talent being an idiot kid on youtube that he's earning a million dollars a year no. or something <laughs> it, it's there's a thing happening yeah yeah and People if are, you're in the right place at the right time so for someone if someone else can get rich off of you you then, can become famous you know right. you can become yes. rich so. so you were doing the website thing and you were doing uh, personal finance blogging and mm-hmm. and what else and, and living minimalism, which is like, it's come around again. Minimalism is back. Really? Yeah. No, it's like, it's all the rage of my mom blogs now. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, That's interesting. I've kind of turned into, I've, uh, since my life has changed pretty dramatically since then, I'm kind of uh, into more of a maximalism phase. Uh, I'm kind of enjoying having stuff again. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I can I see that. Stuff, <laughs> stuff is we're, nice. We're, we have maximalist um with our books, yeah, no, absolutely may, maximalist, like psychotically. An, so <laughs> we may have an illness with our books, but yeah, I'm not you, ready for treatment. I, I'm not ready for you, treatment. Okay, no. yeah. 
We're, no, we're still at the, same, at the same time. You keep taking pictures of, of all your children, and it's absolutely guaranteed. No matter what picture you take of your house, if there's a child in it, yeah. there's at least one child reading. <laughs> that's yeah, true. Yeah. Kind of that's cool. true. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> there's they're that. constantly yeah. reading. And uh, Sam's has Sam's reached the age where he started to just dig into my books in storage. Oh, what's the Sartre? And he's see. pulling stuff out, and I find him reading the most bizarre things. But you know what? If he can do it and understand it, uh, go for it. Yeah, kid. it's terrific. Yeah, so. no, it, if you it can was... only understand a little bit of it. It's not it's pretty sure. exactly. Yeah, sure. I think I think if you've got a little nugget and you want to build yeah. around it, that's wonderful. Yeah. So he, mm -hmm. they've been begging me to finish reading them Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment as a bedtime oh, no, they story. They haven't. They no, have. They, uh, what they love is the uh, Down and Out in Paris because it's down, so body. Down, down and Out in Paris and London. I've been yeah. reading Orwell. Uh, yeah. And but no, they want me to finish Crime and Punishment so that I'll do more Russian accent characters. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. Which are terrible, terrible, terrible accents. Yes. But well, they, the idea they was love to it. Start reading Crime and Punishment to your children. Pauls. That was yeah, that was me. There's a new <laughs> translation that I was excited about. Anyway, sorry, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're we have to stop hijacking. Come on, Paul. We're, uh, we keep derailing the conversation. We really. So you got into web development, and then tell us. So where... I got into web development, and um, as pretty much as a direct res result of that is why I ended up moving up. We ended up moving to Buffalo because um, I lived in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, as we said mm -hmm. before. Yep. Um, and that's fine, that's just kind fine, of, yeah. place. fine town, <laughs> many fine, fine town. people. Um, it's, it's, it's part of the megalopolis. It's part of the, the, east, the, the East coast, uh, suburbs. one city. Yeah. Yeah. I just kind of said, one city. If you're not familiar with the term, the megalopolis is the, is the urban sprawl that goes from Washington DC, DC to Boston. To Boston. And it's basically yeah. unbroken development all the way up. There's and one it's a very space. expensive place to live. Yeah. One space. The last green Valley is Eastern Connecticut. Like That's if you're funny. flying, like it's actually like a uh, airline pilots use it to Tra to figure out to where navigate. they are to navigate. Yeah, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the rest it, of it is city. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Basically, it's city and suburbs or little cities that kind of that are indifferentiated. At least in the eastern part of Pennsylvania, it's a lot of small cities that are basically undifferentiated from from the next yeah. city. Yeah. No, yeah. when you're you're driving around the literally hundreds of square miles of Detroit sprawl. You go freely from one city to another, and you'll cross a border, and you'll not see any difference. But Nothing. Now you're in Nothing's a different changed. city, yeah. right? If you're lucky, you saw the sign. Yeah, hmm. yeah. So yeah, sounds like where I grew up, honestly. <laughs> yeah. So you're so you're at that. So you moved to Buffalo as a result of your web design work. Yeah. So living in living in the mid Atlantic is a very expensive place to live, um, yeah. which is not a thing you realize if you've grown up there, but it's actually yeah. a very expensive yeah. place. Super expensive. Um, and so as part of that whole minimalism and part of trying to compact our lifestyle as much as possible so we could afford to be self-employed, mm -hmm. um, we were looking for somewhere cheaper to live and we looked everywhere for somewhere, to, somewhere to live. We were prepared to move absolutely anywhere because we're self-employed. We can go anywhere we want. And the web work um, is, yeah, yeah. You can yeah, take it with it, you. It, it, we work from home. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So we can live anywhere we want. We could, we could, ref, we could uh, reform our lifestyle however we choose. Now, right. at that time, uh, my partner, uh, th this had to do actually with the jewelry work. We were at a jewelry show um, up near where she grew up. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for... It, it's a very long story, but she en she ended up um, kind of uh, uh, living with her best friend in high school, um, living with her with her parents. And it's a long story as to why, but we were at, we were at a craft show up in the Lehigh Valley, and she said, "Oh, uh, my other parents actually live right over there. You want to go see their house?" Mm -hmm. Sure, why not? So we're driving around in the car. We've just been out in the sun for eight hours and lifting heavy things. So, you know, I was, I, I, I was very I'll sit uh, down, take some AC. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, and I'm driving around, she's like, there, there's my foster mom right there. She's like arguing with her neighbor. And we show up and, and great big hugs and kisses. And, oh, my God, I haven't seen you in forever. And, you know, Hi. this big family reunion. And it turns out that her foster sister was coming down that day to visit from Buffalo. So we oh. hung out for two hours and there's this, and you know, foster sister, best friend, family reunion thing just happened out of the blue. 
And so her foster sister said, you got to come up to Buffalo. I've got a new husband and we have a house and I have a dog and, you know, I have stepkids and Buffalo is great. You need to come, you need to come see it. So we went up and visited and we really liked it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Buffalo is, is one of the nicest places I've ever been. It's charming. People are nice here. It's, it's been, it's the, it's got a lot of that Midwestern nice thing going on. Yeah. Um, and we went up and visited a couple of times and just like, and she's, and, uh, uh, foster sister says, "Well, we have uh, we have an apartment that we rent. We're losing our we're losing our tenant. Do you want to come move into our apartment?" And we decided, "Okay, yeah, that sounds pretty good." So we <laughs> got rid of all of our shit. Wow! <laughs> wow! Got rid of a huge amount. We were going from we we're moving from a fifteen hundred square foot house to a five hundred square foot apartment. Wow! Five hundred square yeah. foot. Yeah, we That's got hard. rid of. Ooh. I mean, I mean, you thought we thought Ooh. minimalism. We, we thought minimalism was one thing. It's just we we got rid of most of our stuff. Most of your stuff in the process. Yeah. yeah. Um, sold the house. Well, it took I don't know about a year to sell the house. We mm-hmm. left it in the hands of a very capable realtor, and mm-hmm. moved up to Buffalo to live in this tiny little apartment, um, mm-hmm. and live a much cheaper lifestyle. That was. Uh, I mean, everybody was nice in Buffalo. Uh, I like the snow. So mm-hmm. and it's yeah. Well, no, if you like the snow, up here. Yeah. I, yeah. I like I like snow. It, yeah. it does. I mean, I think it's possible to um, go a little overboard. <laughs> nine, nine feet seems like a bit much, even for me. <laughs> but I, yes. I did grow up with that, and especially like snowy, snowy city and sparkling sunny snowy days are gorgeous to me. Gorgeous. You know? It's but, yeah. yeah. It's a reason to wake up in the morning for me. Yeah. yeah like oh oh look outside yeah yeah so and and you've so things have things have changed from there so you moved from self-employed work to um employment again well yeah it was Was that transition for well i was self-employed for about 10 years Mm -hmm. um and in that time my business changed several times but i was still basically doing the programming doing uh, doing web development, being just you know growing my skills, mm-hmm. um, and and you know actually giving myself. Looking back on it, I was actually building myself a profession, which um, I did not get in any of my education. Right, um, right. And after you know ten years of this, you know I got I got rid of the partner of ten years. I got a mm-hmm. new partner of currently four years. Um, mm-hmm. I moved several times um i um all in buffalo all in buffalo right yeah. mm-hmm. um i think this is the fifth place i've lived in buffalo mm-hmm. um and uh well the stories actually were complicated than that what happened was about two years ago might, mm-hmm. be, might be three years ago um my mother was uh having back surgery um, fairly intense back surgery. Right. Um, and you know, I'm self-employed. I can work anywhere. I went back down to Pennsylvania to stay with my mom for a little bit. Um, after she had this back surgery, you know, it's just kind of, it's the right thing things. to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's what you do. Um, and my new girlfriend at the time came with me because, you know, adventure, uh, she's, uh, my girlfriend is on disability, so she has flexibility too. And she's all right, we'll go. So we both, trundled on down to Pennsylvania mm-hmm. to do the thing. We ended up staying staying there six months. Wow. Oh, okay. Six solid months because <clears throat> um, um, my mother ended up going in for three surgeries over the course of that time. Oh, uh, Jesus. Uh, Might have been four. My stepfather, who the, the whole goal was I was going to kind of take care of the house and my stepfather would take care of my stepmother, or my stepfather would take care of my mother. Mm-hmm. Um he ended up being sick the entire time too. Oh, um, he ended up going for two surgeries and going in and out of the hospital, and it was just six constant, six months of so you know, constantly taking wow. care of, of yeah. these two people. And if I wasn't there, they'd probably both be dead at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I mean, it was it it, it was that bad. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just six solid, <laughs> just six solid right. months of taking care of two very sick people. Right. Um, 
and I kept my business going as best as I could. I couldn't have done it without my girlfriend. Um, mm -hmm. The two of us, she kind of took care of me, and I took care of what I could take care of, and I took care of my business. I, towards the end of that, I, um, through a complete fluke, I found a job listing for um, a web development company in Ann Arbor, Michigan, actually. Oh, really? Uh, looking, for, <laughs> yeah. looking for a remote uh, web developer. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just like, these people actually sound pretty cool. This doesn't sound bad. This sounds like it's twice as much money as I'm making now self-employed. Who, who so, was, who was you know, it? If you don't, uh, or maybe you uh, don't want to say. The Modern Firm. The Modern, modern Firm. firm. They're, they're a company that, that makes uh, websites for lawyers. Okay. Oh, okay I, yeah. I believe I've heard of them, but I'm not yeah. positive. Yeah, it's incestuous. We all know each other here. Yeah, so <laughs> carry on. Well, I, uh, I did web development in, in Ann Arbor in the 90s, so, mm -hmm. but... I don't know everybody since. <laughs> so. Yeah, t from 25 years ago. Modern yeah. firm. A lot of great people. They don't pay particularly well, but... Good people. That's okay. They're, it was they're, twice... they're good people, and unfortunately it didn't work with that, work out with them, but that's fine. Yeah. Um. So, I, I just like, this sounds like a really interesting place. It sounds like a lot more money. It seems like I'd still be working from home, doing exactly what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Um. So, I started, you know... Talking with, I started talking with them and ended up getting a job. Now that only job only lasted three months. Mm -hmm. Turned out to be a bad fit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so well. I went back to, I went back almost immediately to freelancing again. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of that's kind of where it started. It was uh, um, where where I decided that uh, as much as I've enjoyed having my freedom, I would also enjoy having money. Um, because during, regular I, mean, money. I, worked, I, I was self-employed for 10 years and I never got myself into debt but at that but also over the course of that 10 years I never made more than forty thousand dollars a year yeah mm -hmm. now I've, um, I've I've done some of that kind of freelance mm -hmm. work software development it's I unless you're really really good at selling yourself you have to and, be yeah and really like an entrepreneur at heart it's you can't just be good at the work and expect you know, to earn a living that way. It's yeah. it's really frustrating, honestly. Mm -hmm. It can it can be frustrating, but at the same time, my life I had compacted my lifestyle tightly enough that I could live quite well mm -hmm. on thirty and forty thousand dollars a year. Yeah, because mm -hmm. after all of that minimalism, you know, <laughs> and it was a habit. It was a habit. It was a habit. It was a habit, and I I didn't really have anything, but and I didn't have much money at all, but I didn't have any debt, mm -hmm. and I had all of my time to myself to do whatever I wanted, and I was making enough money right. to pay the bills and pay the rent. I wasn't behind on anything. I never went bankrupt, not even once. That's great. Um, but yeah, no, that's it's no, not small, trivial. But I was no doing, small it, achievement. doing it on on very low on very low wages, and yeah. mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden, I I, I kind of came to the conclusion that you know what, making more money would be nice. I could use more money. I am a money. programmer. Programmers are supposed to make a lot of money. So maybe maybe people should pay me. How about that? Maybe yeah. people should pay me. Yeah. yeah. After after ten years, I decided I wanted stability more than I wanted uh, freedom. I right. I only I mean I've been programming for thirty years, and I it was only actually three years ago that I hit a salary where I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm actually making a lot of money now. Mm -hmm. It took well, congratulations a long <laughs> a long time uh, a long time. I, I mean, but you know, we also have a lot of kids and we're paying for two houses <laughs> so it doesn't feel like, like a, a lot, lot but it, but it is yeah. but thankfully it's there but it's there and so we're i wouldn't I, we don't feel secure mm -hmm. that's the thing because anything could fall yeah. apart we don't have the emergency fund we should have we don't have mm -hmm. the savings or retirement we should have or anything close to that right but but I do earn enough to feel like okay we we're, we're better off than so many people and but reasonably it did compensated take, right yeah but it and it's like fair for how much experience I have and how like that mm -hmm. I can take a job and I can do like what th it would take three junior people to do you know in the mm -hmm. same amount of time and so I don't feel like I'm overpaid but but it does um but it took a long time yeah mm -hmm. and and it's not it's very uncertain the kind of programming that you do I would expect that you would be well compensated for yeah. your work yeah it's, you, it's you, very you don't technical. just do programming you do the the programming you do, what, what normal people are to programmers, you are to, uh, programmers are to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're at a very high, rarefied level of extreme hardness. Well, <laughs> that's what, what I've do. always said, but you know. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you very much. But no, it's I, I, it's sort of it's sort of rarefied. It is rarefied in that a lot of people don't work quite this close to hardware like embedded systems design a very low level code that talks directly to the hardware and um that's goes actually it goes back to the fact that when i started computers were very very slow and primitive and so it was if you wanted to do anything fun on a computer like, to to the like animate something you had to write very very low level code because otherwise it was too slow to do anything mm-hmm. so so that's that's like it grew out of that the fact right. that I got in really with very primitive uh, machines. Machines, but yeah. anyway, so it all yeah yeah. So you had this shift. Yes. Where you realized, hey, you know, steady income is a thing. Yeah, and and mm-hmm. that you did need to look forward to the fact that you know you actually do need to have something a nest egg, uh, you know, some all stability, those things. You know, right. Well, I'll tell you what, it, it only until very recently, um, well, only with my current job, has mm-hmm. my retirement plan not been, uh, my retirement plan not been, uh, join a religious order. <laughs> which is a great my plan. plan. I, yeah, That's that a great was, plan. I thought yeah. it was to join a religious order, yeah. which, which is difficult because I'm an avowed atheist. So, so, there's, some, yeah. so you, there's some details you'll have to work out. You have to start there a religion. There's some details that have religion. to be worked out, but that was my retirement plan. I, I, no savings, no... You have to start a cult in that, in, yeah. under those Oh, there's an idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but don't, honestly, don't, don't let us lead you astray. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, so... so um. So yeah. I finally started started getting jobs. So I finally started looking for actual jobs, and that was about two and a half years ago. Right. And now I'm actually at a, in a, now I'm I suddenly find myself, um, in my third job since then, mm-hmm. um, in a in in what feels like a very strange place. I'm suddenly I've suddenly leapfrogged over the majority of my peers in terms mm-hmm. of financial success. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, going from suddenly. nothing. I mean, to we say suddenly. A, like in yeah, three it, years, it's pretty sudden. No, but I mean, the the sudden part is like all that, all those years of of experience. Right? Well, all those well, years. The, the, no, I'm right. saying the sudden part was between la- that the la- my last job and this job. Well, I know, but um, I'm saying because like, I was making you know average wages in my in my in my first two yeah. real jobs since freelancing, and then all of a sudden. I'm working for a bank now. I am making um, sig- I, I am making a significant amount of money, and yeah. I have all of these grown-up benefits that I never expected to actually have in my life. Mm-hmm. Right, right. But um, I'm, what I'm, I'm making saying a lot is, it's more money than my peers. But it's right. not actually so sudden. Like all those years of experience, even though you weren't compensated well then, that all means something. Right. You, you know? right. Yeah. As an, working as an entrepreneur is real stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's it, in, in a strange way, I think being a, a years of parenting experience made me more employable rather than less in that, hmm. uh, that I, you really have to learn to prioritize and, and um, juggle things better than, than, I, than I ever could before. You know, right, not right. that it isn't diff, still difficult, but like prioritize uh, conflicting. You know, conflicting energies and, and, and issues. And I won't. I won't say that it helps with the inner office relations. <laughs> <rather> <laughs> a lot of experience hurting uh, screaming children, but. Uh, I've but, always you know, said that it if you're hurt. going to work at a large company, one of the best things you can be familiar with is child psychology. <laughs> True. Uh, True. Now, my coworkers in, in my current job are all actually it's it's terrific. They're all very mature, stable, stable, settled people. Low politics. There's n- never even a, a raised voices. Honestly, very very mm-hmm. rarely uh, mm-hmm. in, in a de- debate or a discussion. Occasionally, people will get a little a little agitated. agitated, but it's so it's so much nicer, and it comes from. Uh, from the manager who does just sets a tone, which is, mm-hmm. you know, none of this is, is we're not going to uh, die. You know? Yeah. Right. No, none of this is worth actually, and you know, rage and burnout and exhaustion where a lot of managers don't feel that way, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have a different approach. But so you, you work at a bank now. 
I work at a bank now. Yes, uh, uh, <laughs> I will not mention which bank that I work at. You, you uh, it's you a it's a large to. regional, a, a larger regional bank. It's uh, if you want to do some research, you can probably figure out which bank it is. It's one of the most conservative banks in the country, um, which is actually something I really like. Um, Conservative very, financially, you mean? Conservative financially. Um, yeah. is, honestly, it, it, I don't want to get I don't want to get caught up in in this kind of word fiddling because I think it gets it 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 gets weaponized against people. It's almost conservative socially too, in the right way. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. They they spend an enormous amount of time and energy trying to make sure that um, everybody is treated equitably um, everybody and that diversity is a, that that diversity is as much of a thing as they can make it mm-hmm. um, and that uh, trying to think of a third example and I can't but it's not because they they're 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 they're, they're, they're trying to be progressive and inclusive it's that um, they're actually being very conservative they don't care how it happens they want to hire the best people mm-hmm. and if that requires making sure that there's uh, making sure that that uh, diversity issues are addressed to be able to have access to the widest pool of employees available that's how they're going to do how it they're going to do it there's a cartoon that's how they're going to do it it's 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 kind of a funny way to come at diversity from a from a conservative angle but that's what they're doing there's a cartoon um, that's so, been circulating that that I, I see recently maybe you've seen it which shows uh two kids trying to watch a baseball game or three kids mm-hmm. trying to watch a baseball game, and it shows, uh, and this, the kids are drastically different in height, mm-hmm. and it shows, the the point of the cartoon is showing the difference between equality and equity. Equity, right? Mm-hmm. And where one kid, so if if it's equality, they all have the same size box to they stand on, right? Yeah, they're all the same height. And the short kid can't see it all. Right. Uh, <laughs> and huh. equity means the short kid gets a really tall box so he can stand and look so over the fence. So he can also fence. see. And the so child has no problem see seeing. Game. Yeah. Right. Um, doesn't get a box at all So because he can see. Uh, they're always, always struggling with these two definitions of fairness. When, when mm-hmm. some peop- people say fair, they mean like, you know. Everybody got the same. Everybody gets the same. Everyone pays the same, or whatnot. Or whatnot, right? But it it has nothing to do with like a humane definition of fairness, which is closer to people getting what they actually need to thrive. So, right. Mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I wanted to. You it mentioned you specifically used the word equity instead of equality, mm-hmm. and I thought that was interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It's it's. It was certainly unexpected, but but mm-hmm. but this bank really is kind of kind of backed into a fairly progressive hiring and uh, hiring culture. Right. Um, now that said, it is a bank. It is a very conservative bank. It is a bank that's been around for more than 150 years. There's a lot of old white guys in suits running around. <laughs> Wait, do you have to wear a suit? Do you have to wear a suit? Um, I don't, uh, oh. but it is, but it, 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 we do have, uh, it's, it, we, my office is in fact more formal than business casual. Gotcha. Wow. Um, so that's, uh, so I do wear a blazer IT. every day. I am the kind of person who I, I am now, I, I have now become the person who has to wear a blazer to work every day. There you go. Cool. And that, but yeah. the IT is a little different. I mean, do you have carpet codes kind of situation? Well, here's the thing. I actually don't work in IT. I am working. I am a senior software developer for this company, uh-huh. mm-hmm. for this bank, but I do not work in IT. So the, their so, IT, you're distinct from their IT department. I am distinct from the IT department. They, uh, the IT. I mean, this is a big old corporation. They've got twenty five thousand. They they employ like twenty five thousand people. So all of the departments are very siloed, as I'm sure you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Oh, right, um, and right. IT yeah. is IT. They've got it's their own building silo. Up. Their own building. Yeah, it, it's absolutely its own silo. And this has caused problems over the years. There, it's not yeah. uh, a particularly agile uh, organization, it, 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 despite how much a lot of people try. It's, it's not mm-hmm. agile. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and agile in the software the, development practice sense. Which right. people may not yes. know, know about, but right. that's a whole that's a whole movement in software development. So. Right, 
Uh, so the uh, and on top of it, I've found that the IT department is really pretty dysfunctional, mm -hmm. um, just all on their own. Um, so what happened was is the people who are in charge of digital banking. Uh, it's basically the department of uh, project managers who uh, run uh, different initiatives within various um, uh, electronic banking projects. Right. Uh, one of the managers decided that they were going, in, instead of depending on IT to make websites for them or depending on um, third-party vendors to make websites for them, which is normally what... A lot would of banks do. Right. Bank, mm -hmm. They would hire their own developers and see if they could basically in house uh, their own development agency. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. Okay. Um, and mm -hmm. just have some developers on the floor ready to go to do projects. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very, it, it, it's honestly very experimental what we're doing. Nobody's ever tried anything like this before. Uh, my coworker and I, as far as I can tell, within the entire company, mm -hmm. we're the only two front end developers in the entire company. Where they've got a thousand Java programmers, they have a thousand C sharp programmers. Wow. Um, they have at least a dozen COBOL programmers. <sighs> Um, yeah, they we are the only job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, oh, yeah. We've got. They're, they're never getting rid of those mainframes. But nope. we are the only people who who write interfaces. We are the only people who write JavaScript. We are the only front end people there. Mm -hmm. That uh, either the work has been subject. They've subjected subjected that work to back end developers who didn't want to do it, mm -hmm. or they outsourced it. Yeah. Right. So, um, a yeah, user interface development should not be like an afterthought it's not just something mm -hmm. you bolt on and paint onto your finished product <laughs> really yeah, yeah shocking yeah. i know yeah. um now you see it everywhere though so People treat it that way so there's so here we are trying to make some internet for for our department um we're outside of it we have we so being outside of it we have none of the resources of it so we're stuck using the software and hardware available to your average project developer. Mm, yeah. mm -hmm. um, we don't have access to any servers. We don't have access to any network resources. We don't have access to anything. Um, wow. And we are expected to build and publish um, websites that way. publicly. <laughs> Okay. And, yeah, and we have working with absolutely nothing. And the bizarre part is that we're it's actually working. You're doing it. You're doing yeah. it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What we're doing. What it sounds we, like a skunk the, works kind of thing. So. Yeah, it's it's absolutely crazy. The 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 bank uses um, SharePoint as a CMS. I don't know if you've ever ever been subjected to that terrible. A, a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, SharePoint can be turned into a CMS. It shouldn't, though. It's not designed for it. Mm -hmm. Um, and they've been doing this for five or six or seven years. Um, and it's just been getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And, um, anytime you need something published, um, between, between a, a, a very poorly managed SharePoint site and a very dysfunctional IT department, it could take six months. For, for our done. listeners, the CMS is a content management and, system. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm guessing. But I, this is not my area, really. But yeah. um, but it, it's a, a way of managing like all your digital assets, all mm -hmm. your files and documents and everything, and, and right. keeping them like it's versioned and accessible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's WordPress as a CMS. It's like, it should be a very big enterprise-y version of, of WordPress, and it's not. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, it could take six months to get changes to 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 the content on the company website. Wow. Wow. So what we're doing is actually, um, in it, instead of relying on the system that's already there, we're actually just trying to wipe away as much of the system as possible, and we're just injecting JavaScript into blank pages and mm. completely avoid and doing a complete uh, end run around of the CMS entirely and building static static internet on top of all of that other stuff. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, which this is, is kind of how like, like which is, uh, stuff which is how a CMS transforms. Dies. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is how a CMS dies. If, if you can no longer use the CMS for its stated purpose and you start uh, injecting static code, everything is a workaround. Cracks, it, yeah. 
it, you're using it as a workaround, it's time for a new system. Yeah. Right. But this is how a lot of big projects go in IT mm-hmm. over the course of decades. They get supplanted from the inside out, like, inside out. and mm-hmm. gradually overthrown, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it's... So it seems to me, to me listening um, mm-hmm. to your story, like you've basically stumbled into some success and rewarding work. Yes. Right? Right. Okay. And how do you think that's on on the cusp for your peers? Or is that something that's just not? Can anyone else follow your footsteps? Right, right. In my case, no, it can't. I happen to, it's just, it was all a matter of lucky timing. Mm-hmm. Um, after 10 years of being a, of, of being a freelancer, of being a pirate coder, um, I <laughs> happened to... Pirate code! <laughs> Sorry. I've, that's what I was. I was a hacker for hire. I did yeah. hacker for hire and going in and, and finding and fixing things under very short time frames. That's what I did. Mm-hmm. Um, I happened to find a job where... Um, my education was where I didn't need uh, any you didn't uh, need formal a education. Right. Mm-hmm. I didn't need the degree. What I needed was a, was a hacker mindset mm-hmm. and familiarity with web development uh, techniques from 1999. So right. it, this is kind of analogous to how I got into embedded programming yeah. for the first time, which was a friend of a friend referred me to uh, to help him debug some embedded code for audio drivers for literally literally recording studio interfaces Mm -hmm. and i had never Never uh, done done it exactly i did have some like they said that early low level programming experience but i i jumped in and i did have a computer science minor but um jumped in and managed to and like solve this problem for him, which was right. terribly difficult and t- incredibly right. <laughs> technical. Some of the most challenging code of uh, some of the hardest programming, you know, challenge I've ever f- had really. Right. Um, and, but got it fixed and that like led me to, Oh, this embedded stuff is kind of fun. And I liked that sense of, of panic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and terror. <laughs> Uh, and I always always apart. have enjoyed projects that were kind of uh, like that involved a stress level that many people would not be would willing avoid. to tolerate. Right. They, most people would so, avoid. It. Yeah. But so uh, kind of kind of feel for you in that, and like you say, a freelance, you know, where you don't want to actually. It's it's more fun for me to follow this meandering path and stumble into mm-hmm. things than to like. I'm going to work steadily away at, and I'm going to go get my certification in this and certification in that. Then I'll be a Microsoft certified, whatever for whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. And and actually for those, actually half of the, the duo of our friends in, in uh, Chicago, Uh half of them are millennials. Yeah. Yes. Like, so he's a millennial and that has been his career path. I think he ended up getting, um, like an associate this is a, degree? a couple that we knew in the Saginaw area yeah. who's moved to Chicago. Right. They have a, mm-hmm. a, a age difference a little bigger than ours, so I guess he technically is a millennial. He technically is a millennial. Yeah, and she's, she's a little not. bit older. And um, he's now he's followed a path that's somewhat analogous to somewhere yours. Where he and also like, works for a bank now. Works for a bank, and he found like he was kind of had the right skills at the right time, and his degree status wasn't an issue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they were paying this. Started paying him good money because he was yeah. solving real problems. Solving real problems that yes. people, right. other people weren't could fixing. not solve. Yeah. So, so there he is, and bringing getting, in yeah. bringing in technology that was like, you know, not approved, <laughs> right? Like right. not not part of <laughs> not part of their their whole big infrastructure plan. It was Precisely. like let's mm-hmm. let's sort of work around the fact that this infrastructure is is too monolithic and too big mm-hmm. and not actually moving not actually, quickly enough. Right. Yeah. And um, similarly, there were lots of other folks, all the other folks that sort of, you know, got out of Saginaw yeah, yeah. are, you know, all the overeducated types, all the folks with their bachelors and their masters and some of them with PhDs. Mm. Th- those are the folks who like got on the train to Chicago or New York or, or um, yeah. Northern California. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so, so there's there's a pattern, and then there's like these sort of exceptions, mm-hmm. and I've noticed each of the exceptions have 
some had access to some kind of knowledge that um, is precisely useful. There's always some mm-hmm. some like preparation that happened, which maybe you didn't know what you were preparing for exactly, but, but you, you got are. that experience, right? And then it happened to be useful at the right time in the future. And our friend in Chicago, he also just kind of has been doing IT web sort of yeah. development work yeah. since he was like 14, 15, 16 yeah. years old. Yeah. He's just, just just been doing it. It's fun, it's interesting, and it happened to be a skill. And so like, right. I don't know, to me this, this uh, what would you, so have you got advice to people to like uh, try and, I mean, it, millennials who are not doing so well at the, right. the stage you know, the, in there? The person who dropped off an art history degree, okay? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about here. And I don't mean to like slam art history degrees by a long shot. Yeah, we I've got friends <laughs> yeah. who went into that and that, that's not where I'm going with this. Have found, you know, surprise it's hard to actually work in that field. Right. But then they and, do other things. I'm, do other an, things. I'm right. an English major. Right. You know, right. So So, you know, the folks who got an art or were working on an art history degree and didn't finish and, you know, their interests weren't necessarily this sort of um was effectively a modern equivalent of like being a really good carpenter. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. where well, they can just yeah. go somewhere and get a job doing a thing that people pay you like for, like a journeyman kind of right thing. So they don't have that, right? So what, what do you do? How do you make it? You know, like do you have peers who are kind of getting by, and how how are they doing it? If they're not in the same industry, you know, I don't know. Um, most of my peer, most of my peers graduated from college. If you just look at my graduating class, mm-hmm. the majority, vast majority of my peers, uh, graduated from college. Your high school, um, your high school class. And, yeah, right. or, yeah. 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 My, my high school graduating class. Uh, they, they went and they got college degrees and some of them got English degrees and some of them got art history degrees and some of them got science degrees. And the, I can tell you one of the most success the, the the two people i can think of immediately who are the most successful one is a stay-at-home mom who married a very rich brazilian guy oh, yeah. um, and the other <laughs> mm-hmm. the other is a abd in uh biology mm-hmm. uh, um so she had a master's and she was doing all kinds of research uh, she ended up she ended up very successful she became a trucker well, all right there. <laughs> all right. A long haul trucker. Long haul trucker. Um, everybody else, as far as I know, has kind of fallen into a, <clears throat> even at this age, into kind of a forty five thousand dollar a year office job. A lot of them sell insurance. I'm not sure why yeah. insurance is so yeah. popular, but insurance is a thing. It's, it's easy. It's portable. Um, it's, it's portable it's, and it's easy to get into. But it's, but you yeah, can do it between um, employers. You can get your certification. Do it both freelance and working for an agency. Right. So. Right. Yeah. It's very um, flexible. And uh, you know, and most of them still live in my hometown, which mm-hmm. always surprised me. Mm-hmm. But but it, the the vast most of them are not making more than fifty thousand dollars a year mm-hmm. um, at thirty seven with college degrees, and I don't mm-hmm. know what to what to say about that. I, I don't know. I don't know where the breakdown happened. I don't know what happened in their careers. I know mm-hmm. several of them tried to become school teachers and then ended up going and selling insurance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't seem like education is such a viable profession these days for anyone, yeah, even no. PhDs. And right. right. No, it's yeah, but I know that they went and got an education and they've got office jobs and they got married and their spouse has office jobs and between the two of them, they're, ma- I'm, they're making as much money as I am now working for the bank. Mm-hmm. Right, um, right. It's, it's kind of bleak. Yeah. It, it is kind of bleak. And I grew up in a middle-class neighborhood. I, I, I grew up in a middle-class neighborhood that is comparatively rich to most other parts of the country. Mm-hmm. And it's still comparatively bleak. The job prospects were not that good. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were. I, I know. But the people I know did one guy. He became a glass. Jobs. He became a gla- He became a glass repairman. A window, uh, working, being glass worker. Oh, who who did this? Um, he had, he, yeah, he graduated out of, out of high school and okay, he yeah. uh, he graduated out of high school and went directly into an apprenticeship, mm-hmm. a two year apprenticeship with with a with a with a glass man, the big sheet glass thing. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. He's quite comfortable right now. He's he's doing quite well. 
Mm-hmm. Would you? Um, one of our previous guests, we had a, a woman named Angie on who talked about. Uh, she's a millennial and she's in a, in a trade, right? And mm-hmm. she was talking up the trades, the, trades, the traditional yeah. trades, and saying that all the people she knows that that decided, you know, to forgo college altogether, to forgo college and mm-hmm. and really dedicate themselves to a trade are are doing okay for themselves. They're doing all right. Yeah, yeah. That that's that's what I've observed. The people who the, not many people in in my um in my high school went into trades or you know middle right. class enough that that just wasn't really a yeah. thing well and it was um but the most yeah but the most successful people that i do know they were either trades people or nurses nursing oh, was those a big are the people that yeah. Thing. succeeded yeah right, right that's a that's a as the boomers get older too that's a big bubble for, it's a bit know. of a bubble, but yeah. it's but it's it's working for people but it's right a now. Thing. It's a thing. It's, it's and good, it's good work. My yeah. my peers have all become um, physician assistants. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. So that's how it shook out. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't want to suggest that we shouldn't. You know, if I'm saying, what would you advise people to do other than? You know the fact that eventually we're going to overthrow this entire filthy rotten system from and rebuild yeah, yeah. it from the ground up. But assuming but, that's not ready yet, yeah, <laughs> just put that <laughs> aside for capitalism, the smash the patriarchy, yeah, all destroy that. the, the binary hell, Satan. I mean, yeah, yeah. beyond that, <laughs> beyond that, you know, it's like at what the moment. What can people do at the moment today? Yeah. Right. What can you do today? Because that's a work I, in progress. I honestly don't. I honestly don't know. Um, I would suggest reducing debt. That se- that seems to have worked out very well for me. Yeah. Um, I don't. I mean, I've as my, I, I kind of want to say, don't be afraid to be an autodidact and learn how to do stuff. That, absolutely, um, absolutely. That's well, almost and, everything useful I've ever learned. Has yeah, been, yeah, has yeah. been has been self taught. I, I am entirely a self taught person. Yeah, um, I have no credential, but, but yeah. Right. I've learned a lot of things that I use a lot every day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I be be an autodidact. I mean, it takes a certain personality type to just kind to have that habit already ingrained. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there are a lot of people who say they want they want to better themselves and want to learn. There's loads of services that you can purchase. Oh, yeah, you purchase <laughs> to to help them to to improve yourself and to read more and to learn more things and to have skills and that's great. But you kind of have to, you kind of have to have that habit built that you just explore things Choose. as a ma- as a matter of course, right? Yeah. Um, that you you, and, you follow the little rabbit trail and say, hey, "What's down yeah. there?" and go right. check it out. Right. Mm-hmm. Now you you can you can totally get into. I mean, some some places, especially larger organizations, really because of their internal rules and all that, they still may insist on a degree but i mean you can learn to do that work right if you're generally generally curious yeah clever mm-hmm. person you know mm-hmm. with absolutely without i mean there's so many i can't even describe to you how different it is in 2018 trying to track down like the information you need to learn to solve programming problems in the age of google mm-hmm. than it was in the age of like uh, public libraries and printed documentation before right. there was an internet. You know, yeah, bef- yeah, I don't know how older programmers did it. I learned everything. I, I I know everything I know. I learned from Google. Yeah, I, and it's it's right there. That's think, how I could get away with charging people for stuff I didn't know how to do <laughs> when I first started freelancing. Yeah, and right. you know, and I every time I, I I try to make it a habit that every time I solve some interesting, some challenging programming problem. Um, if it's not entirely proprietary to what I'm doing, if it if it might be at all useful to anyone else, I I write a blog post about how I did it. Right. And people stumble across them. Uh, so they can solve know, their problems. And then, yeah. And that's a lot of people do that now, and it's like this informal Dumbledore's army of documentation writers. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But I I would. Are you are you done with your with your loans now? At this my point, student loans. Yeah, I have I think six hundred dollars left on my student loans. Okay. <laughs> um, I shouldn't laugh, so but my God, the it's next year, they long... should be paid off. Now, to right. be to be fair, my student loans have been I have paid off student loans three times. This would be That's, the third time I've okay. paid off student the, these loans. These are later. Remember, I went back to school twice. Okay. Right. It's never been a lot of money, but it's always been just inconvenient enough to really stick yeah. around. Stick. Yeah. You're just kind of hang with yeah. you. Yeah. 
No, because I mean, you're fortunate. We know so many people who are just buried, you know, yeah, like, the, and they yeah. can't, there's no digging out. There's they no can't digging even out. see bottom. And right. it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's really, it's, I'm not going to say it's sad. It's actually a crime. You know, it's an intergenerational crime. I it's, absolutely right. agree. Well, yeah. and especially, this is the thing I think a lot of people don't quite like get about student loan debt. Yeah. Like, they think it's like credit card debt. Right. I mean, you can't discharge it. Right. It will follow you mm-hmm. to Social Security to and they'll grave. take your Social Security from you. Yeah. You'll, mm-hmm. It will literally follow you to the grave. Yeah. And yeah. then they'll take your death benefits. And then they'll take yeah. your death benefits. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not like, you know, overcharging on your visa. Right. And then seven years later, it kind of wanders off seven years later or maybe mm-hmm. maybe a few years later you get a letter they're willing to settle for 30, settle for a 30, third of it 30 yeah. mm-hmm. percent you know and the, no it's bad for your credit rating but eventually it's gone eventually, eventually it goes. It's gone. right yeah. no it's not like that no i mean it's really it's like a modern day debtor's prison yeah. in that it, it is, follows you everywhere and mm-hmm. it's just attached to you now yeah kind of like and those ankle bracelets it right? was a, a col- like a decision made that hey you know who you know what resource we haven't sucked dry yet? Oh yeah, <laughs> our young, own young, our own young. Yes, who, who haven't, we haven't eaten them yet. Who haven't figured out? <laughs> they who still have optim, enough optimism about the future that they'll believe they'll be earning so much that this it that even won't matter. matter. You know? Yeah, mm-hmm. I got it through. And it turns out we're not. Yeah. It's 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 amazing. Yeah. I mean, we're expected uh, the we're, we need to live near a job. So we either need to live in a place that has uh, a functioning uh, public transportation system, mm-hmm. which means you're going to be living somewhere expensive yeah. uh, in a city, or you need to be able to afford a car just to have these jobs. Just to have a job. To, uh, yeah. Rent, uh, unless you're in an extremely cheap. Uh, Part of the co- part of the country that doesn't have any jobs, you're paying a th- at least a thousand dollars a month for rent. Oh, you've got your student sure. loans to pay for. Yeah. Yep. Um, you need to you need to you know pay for life all in the sal- salary of forty five thousand dollars a year, and we're expected to save for retirement. Yeah. And uh, save for a rainy day. It's not. All, and all it's your, a bad job. All your it's a bad job. It's a bad job. The numbers do not add up no, anymore. Just like, all your, oh, well, your medical you, you co-pays and, your... and everything yeah. and all that as well for when right. something goes wrong. Yes, health insurance. You have to pay for part of your health insurance. Yep. yep. It, we're, it, and it sounds like it you were, it, it doesn't add up anymore. Right, it's you not, were fortunate enough not yeah. to have a personal health crisis yeah. of, of your own during that time. During Absolutely. the time you were unemployed, it was yeah. just yeah. you were lucky. It, it's not even working out for me, and I'm fifty and make six figures. You know, it's so uh, I don't I don't know for how, people. <laughs> earning, how is it supposed to work on forty five thousand dollars? I, I, I just I just <laughs> scratch my head, and I have so much empathy for. Well, those folks, they just need to save their money <sighs> and stop. Eating at Starbucks. Give up the avocado yeah. toast, folks. Put That's, down the avocado toast. So, because you know, but then and you read, yeah. Say, save for a house down. Save for a house down payment. Save for, payment, yeah. save for this. Save, for, save, save for up that. for a better car. I mean, it's, if you yeah. can get through your twenties without a major disaster affecting your finances, it's that's a miracle. very, very lucky, and you still don't, aren't going to have any money. That's, right. that's, uh, you need to make it from twenty-one to thirty-five before. I mean, the art. There's the argument yeah. that nobody's going to pay any real money until you hit thirty-five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. been my experience. There's something but, to that, but yeah, yeah. Um, this, this thing, by the time this you thing have 35, is... you should be set in your career and you should be set up with the beginnings of your retirement and you mm-hmm. should have a house and children and be married at that point. Uh, uh, that's, how? Yeah, right? the, how? <laughs> we so, we, there's no money to do any of that with. Yeah, you can every, get started financially at 35 until then I, we're just, I was, you're just kind of treading water. I right? was started and I've had to cash out, I think, three or is it four? Uh, retirement re- retirement yeah. funds uh, right. due to losing jobs unexpectedly losing jobs, et cetera. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and and you what is the saying you have to to really to get out of poverty if you start in in poverty or, or you've fallen into it it requires 20 years of everything going almost perfectly yes. no mm-hmm. no crises no big unexpected expenses nothing and all that going change on. you've been saving adds up yeah and all the mm-hmm. and if that if that does happen Right. Then your diligent nest egg kind of approach can so, can, can get you 
to a secure place. Can get you to security, but mm-hmm. it almost never works. No, I mind you, I'm not. I'm not knocking thrift no. and savings, and that people should, you know, no, buy the cheaper thing. No, and, but it know. is like tr- literally trying to go every day, every day, day after day, and saying, "Is this?" little tiny luxury absolutely necessary you know can i get mm. like can i get the 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 double mm. thing the or double I, latte yeah or do i have to go with plain coffee today do i have to go with plain coffee that i ground myself after I, because i my bought a bunch of cup. expired coffee at costco yeah. or whatnot you know my 20 cent cup um, or, or what and it's it's thrift so it's demoralizing. People, no, it is. It's absolutely demoralizing. But rich, thrift is thrift is for rich people. It's if you're living on twenty five or thirty or thirty five thousand dollars a year, and mm-hmm. you are absolutely going paycheck to paycheck. I spend a lot of time doing this. I yes. speak from experience. Yeah. You're already being thrifty. There, you've already cut all of those corners yeah um and the difference between you know a cheeseburger and a double cheeseburger and you're worried about being thrifty there that will save you a dollar and at that point it doesn't matter anymore because you could if you have a treat of 12 cheeseburgers a year and you go for the single cheeseburger as opposed to the double cheeseburger that thrift adds up to 12 dollars in savings a year and at that point it just it doesn't matter it's going to evaporate right when yeah. you're when you're it absolutely evaporates into the couch cushions when you're right. when your car's radiator blows out or something right, that twelve like dollars wasn't yeah. the difference yeah. between right. having the car radiator right. or not yeah exactly. so i i was fortunate i uh was well funded with scholarships i did take out some college loans but after i graduated my college loans a four-year degree at a pretty elite private school thirty six hundred dollars and mm-hmm. I think now, um, and I actually was able to pay that off in a couple of years without having to struggle too much to pay it down, even with the uh, sort of a first job out of school. Right. Right. But um, but now people come out with well over a hundred thousand in loans, mm-hmm. and it's unimaginable that they could and get even get folks, themselves right. launched. Folks come out with like twenty five thousand. Yeah. Forty five thousand dollars in loans, which is more modest, right? Yeah. They may have gone to a more modest institution or, or what have you. Or they were funded yeah. and those loans just represent what their textbooks cost. What the textbooks and, cost and, for four years, know, right? right? And even that when you're making twelve dollars an hour yeah. is comical. And all all this is I mean it's absurd. All this is depends on where you live and your you there are and huge dorm. disparities in cost of living. But mm-hmm. but like you say, if you to to earn more you need to live in a more expensive area. And if you're right. trying to pay down a loan Absolutely. you need so we're living now in a like unincorporated area in Pittsfield Township. Right. And we live here because although I my new job Three, well. three years old now pays well is in ann arbor right. and even that job is not in ann arbor it's technically an ann arbor mailing address but it's right. like outside <laughs> of the city but we we could not afford to live in that shangri-la <laughs> of ann arbor, of ann arbor. Yeah. you know because fancy, of fancy expensive ann arbor michigan because of the housing prices so <laughs> right. we oh yeah we the only way you I mean, talked about a shithole, but you know. yeah well it is a racist shithole in many ways but yeah. you t- <laughs> and uh you talk about um you talked about being able to get a a loan for a home without a down payment i had a down mm-hmm. payment for our saginaw house mm-hmm. that didn't go well <laughs> and that's yeah, no, and no. we've lost everything we put into that and then Every dime, some and then some and you then know some, yeah. and uh, so there's no down payment there wasn't the any house. down payment for the next house to get and no value to get back out of that mm-hmm. and in fact it's an ongoing debt ongoing right? yeah um but so we were fortunate in that we were able to get an rd loan a rural development loan mm-hmm. which covers oh, oh, which means we didn't have a down payment, right. and but the 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 along with that, it meant it only covers certain properties in certain areas, certain properties, certain, certain areas, kind of certain. a narrow band of requirements. Right. So 
Does it also mean that the neighbors are no longer going to give you side-eye for watching your own <laughs> children play in the dirt in your own yard? We, we think much, so. Yeah, we think much. so. Yeah. We, we, we it's do, one of the little perks, you know, yeah. little side. Yes. Yeah, we side actually, we are at the end of a little drive into the woods, and uh, we have woods around us. And we do have neighbors that can see us, and... Um, there's a little bit of friction, but it's they're not watching us every day, right? And no. it's 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 yeah. a huge. Honestly, I mean, the main friction relief. is on our part where we've got a dog that wanders in our yard, and we're kind of pissed about that. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm okay. Let's be very transparent. I'm pissed about that. Uh, there's na- <laughs> neighbor a neighbor's dog that runs around our yard and wants to play with the kids. It's like, uh, and it's uh, you know Grace and I grew up under different circumstances uh, in the neighborhood I grew up in and. That was normal. Everybody's right. dog roamed around the neighborhoods, but um, in my neighborhood, she's not yeah, comfortable no. with it. So, well, no, in my neighborhood, if your dog came near our, came near your chickens, it might get shot. Well, there is yeah. that, but right. we didn't. In in uh, Highmire <laughs> Road in Pennsylvania, there weren't a lot of people didn't act, actually we keep chickens. Keep chickens, right? So you know. But um, anyway, we're uh, I th- I think we're um, what. Or what? We can come to some great conclusions. <laughs> well, no, I think we've got a, a great personal snapshot. We have a great personal narrative, and it's interesting. And we talked a little bit about how people may or may not be able to ex- sort of take some advice take or some lessons advice from it. Well, I feel like we've hit, we've hit two important pieces of information. With our two interviews? Yeah. N- number okay. one, trades work... Um, Seems like it's consistently working out for people. It does seem like a viable path. A viable path. Maybe not if you've got two hundred thousand dollars in student loans. I mean, but, it, it's you yeah. have to get on that path before the student loans. Yeah. And even then, yeah. you know, it, it's yeah. And I don't think there, there. Honestly, I don't think there should be any. Uh, no one should feel bad if they have a art history degree that mm. they did put that money into it, and then they wind up becoming a carpenter or a carpenter plumber. Carpenter plumber. Right. It's. You it's can, wonderful, actually. You, you actually now are in a position where you do something completely different for your work, but you can nobody can tell you what you can and can't do in can't the rest study. of your time and study right. and, and teach and share with people. And actually, know? one of my friends that got an art history degree is a carpenter now and works exclusively doing um, sacred architecture. Oh, cool. so, so yeah. now, so actually has, I do think if you're lucky, you do eventually find a way. I can't imagine that pays particularly well, then. Well, yeah, actually it does. It's a little, <laughs> it's a little niche, right? So it's, a, if you're, it's a niche. If you're good right. at this, being able to like design the interior of a chapel or of something. Of a chapel or a church. Maybe and do they all this fly hand you out. Car- yeah. Yeah. All this hand carved cool. woodwork. Um the kind of quality you see in hundred year old churches. Oh, um, there yeah, are, that, there's a, there's a niche of folks who will pay for it. Yeah. That's right. cool. Okay. So yeah. Very cool. So people do I think if you if you live long enough and you putz around at your things, your side hustles right. long enough, there is a good chance that one day you'll be able to bring them together bring somehow. Bring them together somehow some way. Yeah. Right. I think the lesson is that an education is not necessarily going to convey skills. But if you have oh, actual so demonstrable <laughs> skills to do things, right, right, you can exchange that. You can turn that into a career. That seems to right. be what I've observed. Uh, observed. I mean, carpentry, actual skills, programming, actual, actual yeah. demonstrable skills. Yeah. Most right. of the time, that's a different podcast. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I learned the hard <laughs> way that um, even though because of my background, uh, college was willing to hire me as an adjunct to teach. I don't mm-hmm. really have teaching skills. I have an interest in teaching, but it's not the same Not thing. the same thing, <laughs> right. So that, then that's the second thing I was going to, I yeah. think, is, is that you have to have skills, like some kind mm-hmm. of skill mm-hmm. that someone wants to buy. And that's different than a credential or a desire or an interest. Yeah. So, so, yeah. I almost want to like say this, yeah. it's, it's that you have to be able to, if you can learn how to make a thing and do it well, you're set. And yeah, and I think yeah, this is what's what's kind of funny to me, and this is just like my own sort of dark sense of humor. I think that's always been true. I don't think that's new. No, no, I don't think no. that's like a new oh aha moment. I mean, I think that's just mm-hmm. always been true yeah. that you need to be able to make something. I I really want to encourage people to resist the tide of like oh you have to go get your degree in a STEM field, you know? Right? No, no, no. 
uh, some people who no. are really good at math and who are interested in engineering could go into a, a STEM program and do well with it. Right. But that number is a small percentage of the population, and it hasn't really changed really that changed. much over no. time. It's almost like it's like being autistic. I mean, actually, literally, is like being <laughs> autistic. <laughs> right. That you have this sort and, of unusual skill. And not everyone, even if they work at it, will click with that and do well with it and or right. enjoy it. You and know. have a good time with it. Yeah. I mean, and for and the people who enjoy it. the sciences, yeah. you need to be there. Yes. Right? Yeah. But if you don't, I mean, people, don't waste your time on anybody else's. Yeah. People are, yeah, like, absolutely. born to be scientists, yeah. you know, and engineers I to would, some extent. I would absolutely disagree with that. Um, born to be scientists? There's any... I, I don't. I don't think it's it's a born. I don't. I don't think that that narrative of born to be a scientist or born to be a programmer or born to do math is a very good one at all. Oh, um, really? I think, and really? I I firmly believe anybody could learn how to do this stuff. I know that any idiot could learn how to do what I do. I'm the idiot that did it. It's not rocket science. <laughs> yeah, I, but I, and I think and I honestly think anybody could 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 learn. But there are two things that get in the way one you have to want to do it and a lot of people don't it's hard it's complicated it's fiddly it's boring if it has to be self-rewarding if you if with if you can if you have enough internal motivation to get beyond that okay internal motivation that's a that's a key thing uh, that's and yeah okay go ahead and particularly with programming but i think with all of the other stem as well um the the, the 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 secret sauce to be able to getting across that that difficult and boring threshold is that you have a thing you want to make which goes right. back to have skills to make things right, right. Mm. just learning it to learn it never gets anybody anywhere i didn't want to learn how to be a programmer i wanted to make a website that did a thing right. See, so uh, i learned the programming to do it and i guess my, my experience was a little the, different that seems to be the trick mm-hmm. well my experience was a little different because as a kid, I really wanted to understand the thing mm-hmm. in depth for the sake of understanding the things. And even like, even getting paid to, to do a thing, if I didn't like it, uh, mm-hmm. it wasn't motivating. But I, I do agree with you about inter- people have different internal motivations. Well, and mm-hmm. I, I think that's what I'm, t- when I say born for this, that's what I'm talking about. Wait, what that, motivates you? That your mo- that this is something. I mean, a lot of people, people will always say to me, wow, chemistry is so hard. How did you study chemistry? It's really hard. <laughs> I'm like, you know, this is some of the easiest stuff you can imagine. It fits your, your brain. It fits into your brain well. It's really, it's some, I think it's some of the easiest stuff you can imagine because I find it interesting yes. and I want to know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I want to make sense of it. But there are lots of people who have no interest. It, they're not curious about it. It doesn't pique their interest. And, and and the example I like to give is, so, you know, that was very easy for me, and I really enjoyed it, and it came naturally to me. Um, and I spend all kinds of time working and learning and developing skills. Those are like three different antecedents to to reach the same goal, right? <laughs> to reach the same goal, right? It all had to be yeah. present in some proportion. Right, even, even at the outset. I never felt that way about art class. I yeah. never felt that yeah. way about music class, and I still can't carry a tune. Uh, like, well, even if you, I want you, to. You can, but you oh, don't come think on. you can. Well, no. You, well, sang, you I, sang in the choir with me. Yeah, but every time I open my mouth, you remind me that I can't carry a tune. <laughs> no, it's just like, so it's not grace. We're in, we're in F sharp. <laughs> just, you know, join us here on <laughs> not, the page. Not D. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could join us. I'm just asking, you know. So it, it's it's not something that piqued my interest that I wanted to like dive into and learn more. And, you know, I kind of wanted to, and I was interested and thought, wouldn't it be cool if, but it never took off for me. I had interests that led me elsewhere. And I think each person has interests that lead them places. And kind of without that interest, you don't, you don't go there. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen for you. Absolutely. I agree. It's, I, I, but I am, I, as a woman in programming, yeah, I have to be. I, I am very, very sensitive to the idea of the born genius. I'm oh, very sensitive yeah, to the idea yeah, no. of the 
of 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 the uh, of the faded programmer of the people who. Um, no, the, the, I, I'm, you know, I'm, you know that that, no, there the, are millions that idea of that there's a certain there's a type who programs. No, no, right. it's usually a very tightly defined type. Absolutely and not. That's, a lot that's of people true. Who find there are lots of girls of who yeah. would yeah. who would be extraordinary scientists and engineers yeah. who have yeah. it beaten out of them. No, I, yeah, I'm sure. absolutely opposed to. Uh, first of all, uh, this uh, this actually is related to how I talk to people about like music and whatnot mm-hmm. because so many people. Uh, say you know oh I just I wish I had musical talent and I don't feel like I I ever specifically had musical talent I feel like I liked music and tried tried it and you know but no I'm I'm very I'm not uh, maybe I've been not as articulate as I I mean to there are the this the skill that um, can feed you into this kind of work the inclination I, I believe there are some fundamental things that your brain needs to do for you to be good at it um mm-hmm. a lot of people who are in the field actually don't have those things right, right. i wouldn't <laughs> right. necessarily disagree with you but i yeah. would also argue that that thing that your brain needs to be able to do yeah and i think it has to, i personally think it has to do with visualization um yeah, i think that's, that's learned that's a learned skill it. you just practice at it long enough and you will learn it, um, okay, mm-hmm. but I, I think that's I, absolutely a learnable skill. There are a few. There are some people who I think maybe can't ever be good at it, but but there are also a, a huge number of people who somehow were told they couldn't be good at it, or were and they, and they or were it. profiled, or were mm-hmm. stuck in you know. Well, you're you didn't do well on this test, so we're going to put you in the brown section down in the basement, you know. And, right. And mm-hmm. the silver and gold classes are going to go study, you know, go study whatever. The fun stuff. Yeah, and that mm-hmm. happens all the time, and it's a travesty. But right. uh, there are, and, and like, that's very true. I think that's and very true. people are um, profiled and shuttled and routed into these educational ghettos. Systems. But I also mm-hmm. I I the the struggle of people who well, I, the struggle yeah. of people who were told this is the route you have to take and maybe they're just doing it because their parents are telling them to right to get a good job get a good paying job you have to study these classes and you have to do this thing and you have to go into whatever mm-hmm. I, I see so many people now who are students who are in this stuff. And Clueless. they don't, and they're not good at it, and they don't like it. Yeah, they're not good at it. They don't like it. Yeah. They're not curious about it. They don't want it, to learn it's more. Not, it's not fun for them. They feel it's, like they have to be there. And they're unhappy about that. Right. And, and no one should so be trying, there. I'm trying to adjust, that uh, address right. that when I say that not everyone is cut out for this kind of work. Right, you know? right. You know, it's it's maybe it's not for you. Try something else. You know? And also mm-hmm. just this idea that, well, because of this specific economic conditions we find ourselves at this mm-hmm. point having thrown away you know uh our manufacturing sector and discarded whole industries and trashed mm-hmm. whole generations of workers that at this specific point in you know what you might call late stage capitalism <laughs> the the only work that's going to ensure some kind of uh, financial security, security is to to be in IT or software development is uh, is you know it's a travesty that people shouldn't buy that argument because of all the externalities, externalities. right? Well, no, and this and, we and, it, can't, well, and it can't work for hold everyone. Hold on one second, I gotta oh, sure. step away for a second. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and we end up with a lot of nurses that have no business being nurses. Yeah, and, a lot of physicians assistants that have no business near a patient. It's an, an economy can't actually function if the economy is predicated on everyone selling hamburgers to everyone else. Right. Right. No, we can't. We, <laughs> can't, can't, earn we enough. can't all be hairdressers, barbers, and tattoo artists. Yeah, you can't earn enough selling hamburgers to everyone to pay for the job that lets you sell hamburgers. hamburgers. It just it doesn't it, function. It doesn't. It can't. There has to be bigger sort of portions of value coming out of the the. And it has to be. We're talking about economic gardening with Elias. Yes. And it has to be this sort of diversified garden. It can't be a monocrop. 
Yeah, if right. if you have an entire graduating class, it's like the the lawyer glut, right? Oh, oh, everyone has to mm-hmm. go to law school. That's yeah. just the path to a successful career. And so you're like your entire if you're you were talking about the Atlantic, you know, corridor, right? right. It's and the, with and the Ivies and the second tier Ivies, you know, if everyone goes into law school or everyone tries to go become a hedge fund manager, now there's a glut of people doing that, that. Yes. and that, you know what I, what I was saying while you were off is you know you end up you end up with nurses that have no business being nurses you end up with oh, yeah. physicians that have no business being physicians yeah i actually and, hate and so my on. patients but it pays but it pays well, well so. you know yeah i've only killed a few of them yeah uh, yeah and it was totally you know total deniability so yeah, yeah it's good yeah i still yeah. have my insurance well, we should From probably. From my position, I certainly wouldn't want to force anybody into being a software engineer. Right. Um, no, it's, it's, it's But what painful. I do is a very hard thing. And if you want to take the 10 years of practice it took me to yeah. figure it, to turn it into a career. You should do you it. You absolutely should, yeah. Every, yeah. yeah. It, just takes a, it does take a certain sort of person, but I don't want to say which sort. No, right. that's, that's, <laughs> a, that's a very good point. And I, I really right. do believe that um, aside from other, you know, aside from this funneling kids into you know stem a stem career like preparation yeah. for a stem career STEM camp. everyone should have a chance to do everything STEM honestly mm-hmm. because yeah. uh, when i was in high school STEM i daycare. took <laughs> stem take <care. laughs> uh, watch it. these shiny flashing lights so you'll <laughs> one day learn how to program them yeah uh, when i was in high school i it was unusual for me who was shuttled into like the advanced classes and whatnot, you know, the gold team or whatnot to take shop gold and home ec and all this stuff. But I did it because I wanted to, I wanted to like actually learn how to do things with my hands too. Mm-hmm. And I, I really think everyone should be exposed to agriculture work everyone should be exposed to mechanical things to woodworking to metalworking to everyone making jewelry to everyone should learn how to cook everyone should learn how to balance a checkbook everyone should learn how to do you know like virtually every sum of everything there is to do and get a taste and get a taste of it and mm-hmm. maybe they'll find hey your, your thing yeah Yes, I need to go participate in some late stage capitalism myself. <laughs> okay, oh, I gotta yeah. get out of here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, we'll we'll talk you to, to your grade. Yeah. So thanks yeah. for coming on, Meredith. Let's do our sign off. We're gonna we'll, we'll sign. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you for so. having me. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com, where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube. Bye. See you next time.